Welcome to today's episode of The Growth Zone. I am Christian Bartsch. What is the core benefit of listening to this show? Business leaders in corporate and privately held companies gain insights into trends and strategies that provide them with a competitive advantage in the marketplace. Each episode focuses on an area such as marketing, sales, innovation or funding that is absolutely critical to the growth of companies, whether they are startups or corporate global players, where management needs to juggle the challenges of market entry or knowing how to navigate the uncertainties of disruptive developments. Mind feeding is where clarity evolves and helps solving organizational challenges. For those who listen to the entire episode, I have a special surprise gift. I am working on some great guests that are industry leaders in management, innovation and marketing. Let's get started on today's episode. So today I am with Dan McGaw. And our topic is how tech companies can grow beyond the rule of 40. Before we get started, Dan, can you please tell us a little more about yourself? Yeah, and thanks so much for having me. I appreciate you, you having me on the show. Uh, I'm Dan McGaugh. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called McGaugh.io. Um, we're a marketing technology and marketing analytics consulting company. We help companies basically figure out their customer journey, how to pick their tools, leverage those tools, and then optimize that customer journey for growth. Uh, and we're also the owner of another SaaS product called UTM.io, which is a campaign data governance product used by a lot of big enterprise companies, uh, companies like Twitter, Shopify, Unilever, uh, use us to manage all their UTM and campaign tracking links for the internet. Um, been in the SaaS space uh, and marketing space for over 20 years. So uh, got my start back in 1998 sending mass emails since before there was even mass email. So the easiest way to kind of summarize my career is I've just seen some stuff. Um, and most recently, people recognized my name from when I was the head of marketing at Kissmetrics. Uh, we were one of the pioneers in the analytics space, had an extremely popular blog. I was very fortunate to be the head of marketing there, actually took over for Neil Patel, um, one, of the, one of the main guys in the space and one of the founders of uh, Kissmetrics and Crazy Egg, Hello Bar. Um, and I took over for Neil at that company, which was super awesome. Yeah, that sounds really great. And I think uh, you're based in Orlando, right? Yeah, Orlando, Florida. Uh, it's a beautiful day outside. It's it's 62 degrees Fahrenheit, so uh, a little bit wonderful. Uh, a little cold for me because I am now a Floridian. Um, been in Florida for about 15 years, uh, so it's a pretty awesome state, though. Yeah, well, I, I think you'll be as well anyway, uh, noticing in the few, next few months that lots of prominent people are moving over from California. As I've seen, they're either going to uh, Texas, Florida, or Hawaii. When you mm -hmm. go and look at uh, the Oracle founder, he's decided, obviously, he needs even greater distance <laughs> from, <laughs> from Silicon Valley. But uh, yeah, it's definitely Florida is a nice place. Uh, I think last time I was in Orlando was like two years ago. Um, let's get a look at what the rule of 40 actually means. So the rule of 40 balances sales, growth and profitability in the hyper growth SaaS companies with an emphasis on sales growth and scale in these businesses, the rule of 40 essentially states that a SaaS company can be considered healthy if its sales growth and profitability are a combined 40%. So Dan, when you think of it, um, we want to, to reach those uh, levels of being healthy or even extremely healthy. Um, it means, of course, that we need to have a really good marketing, business needs stuff, analytics, and, and all these different other opportunities. What do you think are the best ways actually to go about it as a tech company in order to really um, exceed in what you can do with marketing scale and analytics and all these things? Yeah, great question. I think one of the, the most important parts is you really have to start with a good foundation of analytics. I think uh, some companies are able to grow, of course, without being very cautious of the numbers. But in most cases, it's just not the case. Um, you really do need to have good analytics to kind of tell you what's going on. And I think a lot of companies think that Google Analytics is going to get them really far and they, they just try to depend on that. 
But as a subscription-based business or even an e-commerce business, you're only as valuable as your second, third, or fourth sale or second, third, or fourth month subscription. And Google Analytics just doesn't give you that insight. Um, and even the subscription tools out there, uh, Chart Mobile as an example, or Bear Metrics, they help, but they're really not going to tell you the user behavior, all the different metrics around your MRR or ARR. So I rarely recommend getting a good SaaS um, analytics product. And there's there's a lot of them out there. I mean, Amplitude is one of the most popular. It's free for up to 10 million events per month. Um, it's not exactly easy to implement. Uh, a lot of companies hire us to do that implementation for them. Um, but I would definitely recommend making sure that you have a good product, whether that be Heap, Amplitude, Mixpanel, Kissmetrics, um, because they're going to be able to tell you a lot more around that subscription revenue or that repeat purchase rate to really understand, um, are you able to hit that 40% uh, growth rate? And then as well as as you're getting there, what are all the things that lead up to that? I think a lot of companies kind of put analytics second, right? They're more focused on how do we build the product. Um, and I think that's kind of a, a bad way to go about it. You need to build product, but you need to measure all of those features. Um, and I think that's really important. I mean, even at my own company, UTM.io, which is an analytics tool, um, we build features, we very luckily incorporate analytics, and it's not always the first thing that we have in our mind, but we have to get them on there as soon as possible. And we've, we've identified multiple features which hurt our growth and aren't effective for users, even though we thought they would be. So the analytics, I think, is really, really important uh, to make sure that whether you're building specific product features, whether you're building out marketing campaigns or sales campaigns, um, you know if they're working or if they're not. Mm -hmm. So certain features, as you say, they can really be even hurting your growth. And um, what could that, for instance, be as an example? Yeah, great question. And I'll use our, our UTM.io as a specific example. We're trying to build a growth loop inside the product. Um, a lot of companies, um, a growth loop is going to be something which adds value to the customer and then also can add new users basically to the product. And as that new user comes in, they find value in that same feature and that adds more users. So we created three features, which basically you do an action, uh, which is giving you value, which is you created a UTM campaign link. Uh, and then it asks you, would you like to create a template for what you just created? Um, and then you say, yes, I'd like to create a template from it, pops up another pop up. And then it asks you, do you want to share that with the rest of your team or invite new team members? And this basically is giving them value, giving them value and then saying, hey, now that you've gotten this value, you should share that value with other people. Um, and what we really did was we created a fantastic growth loop there in the fact of like the way that it cycles. The problem is, is the way that it was designed is it feels like a pop-up after a pop-up after a pop-up, um, and it's not the best implementation. And we were able to look at the analytics and see that people were kind of being turned off by that flow. Um, and it really came down to the amount of pop-ups that somebody was getting. And this is a common user experience uh, thing that we just don't notice as we're developing the product sometimes um, in, in all businesses, right? We just don't see the way that the customer is going to see this. Uh, and that really is going to, it causes the user to be like, oh God, I keep getting all these pop-ups. However, we have the exact same feature on another uh, part of the product, which is, hey, save this parameter. And then when you save that parameter, uh, you can send that out. Well, the save parameter is used 10 times more than the save template flow. And the, the main reason for this is because there's only one and a half pop-ups compared to the template flow, which is like three and a half pop-ups. So it feels less intrusive on that person's um, experience. And that's where you don't notice these things when you're developing them sometimes or you're building them, you're set out to accomplish a goal. And then after the fact, you're like, oh, wait a second, this growth loop is bad, but that growth loop is working. Um, okay, I can look at the analytics and compare them and see which one is better and which one is worse. And this happens in products all the time. I mean, we even at Kissmetrics, we would launch products which were extremely successful, which would blow me away, and we would shut them down. And then we would have products we would launch would extremely suck, um, and the metrics would not be good, and we would keep them. Um, and it can be hard to look at the numbers and sometimes uh, call your baby ugly, um, and then also have to realize like, hey, I've got to, I've got to uh, kill that new feature aka the baby. Um, and that's hard for people. But the numbers, in many cases, don't lie. Yeah, and that's the thing, of course, when when you're just using it yourself, you are so into it that you understand how it works. And you, you've got all your mind wrapped around it. But somebody else who doesn't uh, think the same way, they'll be absolutely screwed. And, and I think that's the key thing why then uh, certain features then absolutely suck and then people just don't like it. 
um, for instance, because they maybe don't they fit maybe into one kind of industry but not into another one. And the same thing can be as well with, with, for instance, accounting systems. I've used accounting systems in different countries. I've used an accounting system that's for Australia, for the United Kingdom, and for Germany. And that's the same version exists as well for USA. But in different countries, you have different kinds of tax reports. And one, you can send it electronically, click it, and send it out. And another one, oh, God, I have to print it out. Really? <laughs> Um, oh, that was a problem I need a with Help me, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that, was, that was a huge problem with Tableau, and they they basically uh, took for all, forever to fix it. And this is many many years ago, um, where they didn't have a dashboarding feature, so they forced their users to save a PDF of a dashboard or print a PDF of the dashboard, and it was a problem that they had to deal with. Um, but luckily, their product was so good compared to their competition, people would overlook this this stupid feature uh, that they didn't have. Um, so it's definitely, uh, you've got to find the balance uh, in, in it all, especially when dealing with product. Yeah, uh, that's that's definitely the case because then when you look at that, of course, if the tool is so important and you haven't got any much, no other really choice because all the other stuff just doesn't work for you at all, or it's just not really geared to your your needs and it's not helpful. But nevertheless, um, when you look at at Kissmetrix and all the other companies that you see and and experience, um, and especially when you think of analytics, what are the things that actually companies can do then once uh, they have that kind of information and and as well with that uh, UTM system that you were mentioning and that? Yeah. So I think to, to really hit growth right in a company, you have to be very, very prioritized and you have to, to wage your battles. Um, in any company, you're going to have limited resources, right? And if you're focused on uh, the rule of 40 as an example, right, you want to make sure that you can maximize your profits as much as you can so you can be on the right side of that, right? So uh, if you can get 10% growth while having 40, or excuse me, 10% uh, profit while having 40% growth, you're crushing it, right? So if you hmm. want to hit those types of metrics, uh, you really have to prioritize your resources and focus on the things that are really going to push you forward. And in every company, that's going to be different, right? Naturally, I would always stress if your product sucks, okay, great. Well, you're not going to make it anywhere, right? So you really do have to make sure that you have a great product, great user experience, um, great great kind of follow-up. And that doesn't mean that the product is pretty, right? It just means that the product has to work for your customers. And the best way to figure that part out is, of course, to do lots of product interviews. So as an example, in all of our companies, and even when I was at Kissmetrics, when I was at Code School, and all the SaaS companies we've worked with, you've got to have constant communication with customers. And you've got to be doing more Steve Blank style um, customer development, like not leading questions like, do you think this feature is cool? You've got to ask the question of like, how do you solve this problem today? Um, you can't be asking them leading questions or showing them stuff because nobody wants to hurt your feelings. So I think that product has to be really developed uh, to help your customers, great great user experience, accomplish the problem they have, make it efficient and make it effective. And I think that's a, a hard thing for companies to do. A lot of times people make products which are efficient, but they're not effective, or they make products which are effective and they're not efficient. If you can get those two down in your product, your product is going to do a lot better. Uh, and that's really, really important. But with the product aside, you have to figure out how you're going to get awareness. Um, and I think that's different for every company. I, I can speak very, very specifically. Um, in some companies, you just can't afford, or excuse me, some industries, you just can't afford to play the PPC game. You can't afford to really throw money at the problem and hire a bunch of salespeople, right? You have to choose the organic content marketing because it's cheaper in the long run. It's going to drive a better, a better channel for you. But some companies just can't do that route to be able to hit their growth targets. And, and I can't tell what company to do there. And I think um, as an example with uh, at least UTM.io, um, we have focused heavily on organic traffic for the first three to four years, right? We knew that that was a path we needed to go after. We built uh, free tools, we built all kinds of blog posts, we built all kinds of content, and that drove traffic. However, when we found product market fit, which everybody needs to focus on, our product market fit is very specific. We sell to multinational corporations in a lot of cases, large marketing teams that are spread out across multiple uh, geographies is really where we focus our, our effort. Um, however, if we want to attack that product market fit, we can't depend on 
SEO and content marketing to get there because we need to be able to be much, much more targeted. And we're hiring a sales team to do that. Our sales team has been very, very effective. They've been able to increase our MRR by over 20% month over month. So like those things are really, really helpful. And that's where in your business, if you want to hit those growth goals, you've got to one, have the analytics, right? Which is going to tell you how people are using the product, how are people paying and all those things. But I would also say you have to build out, um, like we use a, a framework here called the Vice Framework. Uh, if you Google it, it's on our website. It helps us do prioritization to figure out like what campaign or what program we're going to do first. And that helps us prioritize. But then we just look at the financial model and the P&L and we go, where are we making our money? Where are we spending money? Where are we losing money? Where are we going to get the most bang for our buck? Um, and we really do base it all on math. Um, and we run out the, the financial equation on if we hire somebody in marketing, how long will it take to get there? And if we hire somebody in sales, how long will it take to get there? Um, and in our case, sales was the model. So um, you really do have to do the financial stuff. Don't just depend on your gut. Make sure that you have uh, real numbers to back your decision up. Um, but every company is going to be different uh, in regards to how they're going to grow, whether that's going to be growth loops, whether that's going to be salespeople, whether that's going to be SEO or PPC. Uh, and it's going to change as your company grow. And I think that's really important to note. Yeah, that's that's quite sensible when you think of that. Um, if you haven't got the numbers, it doesn't make sense. You don't know in which direction you're steering. And uh, then, of course, you can't apply as well the rule of 40. Um, nevertheless, of course, uh, how can you actually go and really then um, take it further on? As you say, you you target maybe four years or so the growth, the, the organic growth. What else can you do then? in order to speed it up because of course organic growth does take some time and uh, some companies revert to somehow doing small advertising campaigns and all that stuff targeting one kind of niche yeah i mean i i definitely think you can seo ppc are probably some of the most common naturally uh, sales is another awareness tactic doing a lot of promotion on whether that be um, Reddit or any of these other services that are going to be big community driven things. I know that a lot of people focus on writing media and blog posts and try to get the word out there. I know LinkedIn is a very, very um, big market for me. Naturally, I'm on a lot of podcasts. I do anywhere between four to eight podcasts a month. Um, so once again, there's a lot of different ways to be able to get promotion out there. I think the big thing is, is you really have to make sure that you have a funnel Uh, that you're going to be sending these people down uh, and make sure that you understand that funnel and you can continue to confer conversion rate optimize that funnel. Um, I think a lot of people uh, just try to send people to the homepage and hope for the best. But there's different ways that you need to approach different audiences. And there's different value props that you have to get in front of each one of those audiences. And if you're really looking to kind of accelerate um, that process, you have to, once again, look at the analytics and like figure out where in the funnel are people dropping off? Why are they dropping off? Try to get a hold of those people and talk to them. Um, and do conversion rate optimization. I mean, we're always running experiments on our sites, um, always running experiments in our sales program to try to push people down uh, that funnel and try to understand where they're falling off. And I think that's a, a really big component that you have to focus on. Yeah, you can do all this awareness, but if everybody comes and nobody converts, well, you got a problem and it's either with the message or it's with the, the content on the website. And then the thing that I would say that we're, we're most focused on in a lot of the companies that we work with, what we're trying to figure out how to do is how to create a growth loop. Um, if you're a SaaS business and you're dependent upon users, um, a growth loop is going to be free awareness and then as well as free signups, right? And in many cases, free customers. And many of the large, large companies that you hear of today, everybody from Facebook to Twitter to Airbnb to Uber have created extremely effective growth loops. Um, and some of those growth loops are, of course, everybody's familiar with Uber's get $20 off your next, uh, next ride if you have one person sign up. And that's not as much of a growth loop because that's really a referral loop. But at the same time, uh, it does work in the same fashion. Um, so you really have to figure out that funnel. Um, and if you're in a SaaS product, for sure, you really want to figure out how you create a growth loop. And I think uh, the book by Nir Eyal, um, Hooked, is really, really helpful for you to get your mindset into how do you make these products habitual? But then how do you get into this loop? Because the whole book, Hooked, is around how do you build that habit loop? And the habit loop is the same exact thing as a growth loop, pretty much, except for the differences is you're adding somebody else to the party now. So you have to change that habit loop into getting somebody else into the product. And that's going to be where you see a lot of exponential growth. And in some of these companies is when they really figure out their growth loop, uh, they can really work. But I have to stress, if you build the growth loops wrong, you could really hurt your product too, right? So you have to be, you have to be constantly iterating and testing. 
Yeah, that's when you, for instance, look at Zoom or so. When the pandemic started everywhere around the world, everybody was starting using it, but the system just couldn't cope with the sudden growth of usage. And then afterwards came all the problems about security, people logging into other people's um, Zoom uh, connections and so on, which created a lot of insecurity and everybody running in all different directions and so on, creating a mess for Zoom. But they obviously have uh, managed to... Um, find their way back onto the road instead of being stuck in the ditch and uh, getting people I, as well think, as secured. I think there's security problems, right? Even though it sucked, mm -hmm. right? They were all pretty straightforward fixes and they weren't a huge yeah. problem before. They got so much press and news because of that, that I think it helped them just as much as it hurt them. And I think in the long run, um, they'll be totally fine. Like I'm still extremely, extremely bullish on Zoom. I bought a crap ton of their stock right before COVID happened. Uh, I bought mm -hmm. even more of it during COVID. Um, and you know, um, I think that the even when you get bad PR like that, if you can recover, um, I think in many cases it's gonna you're you're gonna be fine. And I think over the next five years, um, Zoom is gonna continue to be a, a huge player. And I think in the next couple of years. Either they're going to start on an acquisition spree of acquiring a crap ton of companies because they have the capital to do so now, and that's really going to help them. Or somebody like an Oracle is going to come out and buy them, uh, which will make the rest of us happy. But I think sometimes people are like, oh, the security thing, it's all this stuff. At the end of the day, um, they got more press than GoToMeeting or Skype or any of the other people out there. Um, how they were a, a COVID story, how they were a COVID nightmare, all these things. We have to remember, sometimes bad press is just as good, if not better, than than good press. Exactly, and it travels faster and wider than the good press because uh, most people are just hungry for some new scandals and all that stuff, and they love it, and they suck it up because they're just maybe bored with the day. It's not like us uh, busy thinking about how do we do in the next business, how do we create this or that product or create that growth loop, as you say. Mm. It's quite a difference to those who are just looking for something to complain about. Um, but if you're looking for opportunities, it's actually good as well because you notice, okay, maybe there's an opportunity in this area or in that area. And that shows as well whether you can even introduce certain things and features into your own products. Um, yeah. Now, so going back to mm -hmm. something that you had asked earlier in regards to like how do companies create this growth, right? And I think there's an important mm -hmm. thing that I learned from a guy at Slack. Um, and I think this came out of Brian Balfour from Reforge. Um, you basically, in, in most SaaS companies, you have two models, right? You have a freemium model and maybe you have a you have a trial or just a paid model. What you have to remember is that the freemium model is very much like having, um, if you think about a river um, or if you think about a river that has a, a lake in it, right? So um, a freemium model is very much like having a lake or a pool of users. Constantly getting mm -hmm. new ones or getting added to this pool. The pool is constantly growing. And then if you have a trial or just a paid model, you basically have a, a river or a stream, which means you constantly are just having users come in and users go out, right? And you really have to understand what model you are. And when you get into that mindset of understanding, okay, I have a river or I have a pool of users, um, it changes the way that you fundamentally have to think about uh, your product development and as well as your sales and in your marketing. Because if you have the pool that's going to be ever growing, but not many people are going to use it, but a ton of people are going to use it for free forever, you have to change your marketing and as well as your sales program to work with that. And then same thing goes with the river. And at, at UTM.io, our freemium product is amazing. Like it is by far, all of our competitors make you pay for what we offer for free um, and it will remain free forever. But we have to take into consideration that's a bottom up approach. Um, and for you to have that bottom up approach, um, you really have to have marketing that fits for that. And then with the other one, if you have a river approach, right, and you're you're now selling to decision makers, you're, you, you've got to get these people sold in 14 days or less. Um, your marketing and sales is going to be much different. And so is your product. Um, and it's really important to take that in consideration as you're designing whatever growth thing you're doing uh, around. Am I am I a pool or am I a, a river um, in how I have to do my marketing and then build out from there? Yeah, that's, that's something really that you need, of course, to take into consideration and see how things work. Um, I saw just recently that you had, a, you've got as well a book, I think it's called Building Cool Shit. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, so I uh, I wrote a book last year called Build Cool Shit. Um, it's the market. It's the modern uh, marketing tech stack blueprint. So uh, it's a it's a case study written about one of our uh, cool customers and and how we uh, rebuilt their stack and how you can do it yourself. And it really focuses on how do you track. Uh, the customer, both online and offline, and then leverage all of the data that you're getting to then create personalization, enable your sales team, and then push that person down the funnel, and then also have reporting. And this is really taking companies from the legacy stack, as we would call it, um, and bringing them to the modern stack, uh, where you have things like a customer data platform, you have behavior analytics, um, you're leveraging really modern um, automation, and really doing crazy cool personalization. Uh, and the book takes you from, hey, this is where you're at today. This is the start. And in full color pictures and all kinds of stuff like that in the book, um, it is a, a hard copy book. It is a soft cover. Um, if you were to go to our website, just maga.io, um, you are able to order a copy of it off our website. Uh, we are able to offer the book for free. Just cover your shipping uh, and we'll be able to get the book shipped out to you. So definitely recommend people to check it out. Cool. That's certainly something good. I'll add as well into um, our podcast description. I'll add as well the link to it. I'm sure people will want to read it and uh, use the time as well over Christmas, New Year and so on as well to get new insights, mind feeding and maybe even connect with you. Um, where can actually people can connect with you besides uh, on your website? Yeah, great question. Um, I'm most active on LinkedIn. So just go to LinkedIn and type in Daniel Maga. Um, you'll be able to find me on there. I definitely am more active on LinkedIn than all the other networks. I'm not sure why I never really got into Twitter, uh, but <laughs> LinkedIn is definitely more of my place. So uh, if you're looking forward to connecting, come hang out with me on LinkedIn. Great. Then it was awesome having you here on the show and I'm sure people got some great insights. Well, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure to be here. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of The Growth Zone with Christian Barge. Thank you for listening. Please leave a review or rating here on iTunes or on podchaser.com. If you found the content helpful, then share it on social media. I would like to invite you to follow our show so that you don't miss the upcoming interviews with leaders in the market. Simply visit the website follow.prmediareach.com. I will be adding the link also to the description of this episode so that you just need to click on that link. For those of you who are listening and signing up to follow the show, I have reserved a free copy of the ultimate guide on content marketing. This is the strategy that got me top corporate clients like McDonald's, Linde, Hewlett Packard, Deutsche Bank, Volvo and many others. That strategy has been working for over 10 years. It also got me contracts with police, transport authorities, military and several universities and even leading research institutes. For sure, it also worked wonders as it got me many small, medium-sized entrepreneurs and enterprises as clients. And that even included international clients from all around the world. The link to sign up for our free broadcasting service and the guide is follow.prmediareach.com. That will give you access to the most recent version of my ultimate guide on content marketing. You can follow me as well on Twitter by using the Twitter handle CAP Barge. That's spelled Charlie Alpha Papa Bravo Alpha Romeo Tango Sierra Charlie Hotel. Yes, that is CAP Barge. Charlie, Alpha, Papa, Bravo, Alpha, Romeo, Tango, Sierra, Charlie, Hotel.